It was the evening of November 3rd, 1870, and there was this woman, Laura Fair. She was dressed in all black, and she covered herself with a black veil. But guess what? She was following her lover, Alexander Cretenden, onto the San Francisco-bound ferry El Capitan. On board the ferry, she found him sitting on a bench with his wife and kids. And out of nowhere, she whips out a brand new pepper box pistol from her cloak and shouts, You've ruined me! Next thing you know, she shot Cretendum in the chest, and within hours, he was dead. Quite shocking. A few months later, she was convicted of murder and sentenced to death by hanging. But wait, she pulled off something even more mind-boggling, using gender stereotypes, and was able to set herself free from her death sentence. It's a twist that still leaves many scratching their heads today. But before we look at what she did, let's dive into Laura's backstory. Born on June 22, 1837, in Holly Springs, Mississippi. She is known to have been married four times, divorced twice, and twice widowed. Her family was always on the move since her father didn't have a stable job. He eventually died in 1853, and the family finally settled in New Orleans. At the young age of 16, she married William H. Stone. He was twice her age, but the marriage was short-lived as Stone would die a mysterious death a year later. She married again, but this time to a man named Thomas Grayson. However, the marriage was a complete disaster as Grayson would often drink and sometimes abuse her violently. The marriage lasted for just six months and Laura started divorce proceedings along with her mother. Life wasn't really exciting for her so she and her mother decided to move to California in hopes of a better life. California, in 1848, was a very attractive city due to the large discovery of gold. Thousands of people flocked to the city as they sought to become rich. By 1852, San Francisco was already crowded with more than 35,000 newcomers. Upon her arrival, Laura started a boarding house business in the city. With the many young men coming for the gold rush, they obviously would need a place to stay. This made boarding house businesses to thrive. Business seemed good at first, but then the glory days of the gold rush soon faded. By 1857, San Francisco was in a deep slump and businesses went bankrupt. Laura's boarding house business was also affected and her bills were on the rise. She and her mother tried setting up more boarding houses, but the story was just the same. More empty boarding houses. In her effort to survive, she quickly switched to becoming a music teacher. She taught mostly the daughters of the elite, but that still wasn't enough to pay her bills. Things got really tough as debts kept piling up. She decides to try acting, and she landed a role as an actress at the Magaya Opera House in San Francisco. Laura turned out to be a very good actress and was able to make enough money to pay off some of her debt. But as soon as the production finished, she decided not to continue with her acting career. Back then, society was not fair to women, as acting was considered a dishonorable occupation for women. Even the most celebrated actresses were not welcomed in society. In 1859, at the age of 22, she and her mother decided to move to Shasta, California, where Laura tried her hand at running another boarding house. There she also crossed paths with William D. Fair. William was a lawyer and a West Point graduate. He was 15 years older than Laura. They got married, and her name became Laura Fair. Despite her newfound societal status, Laura's life wasn't all sunshine and rainbows. The marriage hit rough patches as she later discovered that William had been feeding her a bunch of lies. She still made every effort to keep up the appearance of the marriage, but things weren't improving. After a brief stint, they borrowed $200 and moved to Eureka, California. In August 1860, Laura gave birth to their daughter, Lilius Lorraine. But life was still very hard on them and on November 1861, the couple decided to try their luck in San Francisco. But life took a dark turn for William Fair, and he decided to commit suicide on December 17, 1861. William's death was quite a shock to so many, and they demanded answers. But Laura in her testimony insisted their marriage was strong and there was no reason for him to take his own life. But no one believed her. They all believed she made her husband kill himself. She felt like her life was over, and she blamed herself for picking the wrong men. At 25, she had already lost two husbands. In the summer of 1863, she left California and moved to Nevada. Still hopeful she could rewrite the story of her life, she opened another boarding house. But this time around, Laura struck the jackpot, thanks to a massive silver ore discovery under Mount Davidson, close to Virginia City. She finally achieved the financial success she desired. 
she began to exhibit not only a strong business sense but also an unusual willingness to take financial risks. She went all in, expanding her business as she acquired the 37-room Tahoe house, and she became a landlady to both the wealthy and the poor, who rented rooms in the boarding house. Business was so good that there was never a time when the building was empty. She quickly became one of Virginia City's most well-known and prosperous women. Her monthly income rose to a cool $1,000 a month, and she wasn't just splurging on fancy things. She was smart, with her cash, investing in those lucrative mines that brought her enormous returns. While Laura was enjoying the dividend of her hard work, then came the man who would soon ruin her life. Alexander Parker Crittenden. He came to Nevada in hopes of becoming successful, just like Laura. He was a lawyer from San Francisco, and he used to be a politician in California. Crittenden was from Kentucky, and he went to a fancy military school. He then joined the army for a while before switching to work on the railroads. He was married to a woman named Clara, and he also had 14 children. But sadly, seven of them died at an early age. His family was in Texas, where he also studied to be a lawyer. Crittenden rented a suite at the Tahoe House for $100 a month, which made him a tenant to the young businesswoman. They both became good friends, and Laura liked him a lot. She started helping him by investing a lot in his business. She believed Crittenden was the one who could finally give her the happy marriage she had longed for. Little did she know that her life was about to be ruined. Crittenden showed her great love. He even asked her to marry him, and she said yes. They didn't care what people thought about them. They were madly in love with each other. But then she found out something terrible about Crittenden, something that would break her heart. Alexander Crittenden had portrayed himself as a widower, but eventually Laura discovered that his wife, Clara, was still alive and had eight children with him. His story of being a widower was a total lie. But hold on, the drama doesn't stop there. In an attempt to salvage the situation, Crittenden spins a story about divorcing Clara within the next six months. He's practically on his knees, pleading with Laura to stick around. Now, the poor young widow finds herself in another complicated situation, all thanks to Alexander's web of lies. To reassure Laura about his divorce plan, Crittenden painted their future together, practically begging for trust. Once again, Laura, trying so hard to remain a faithful lover, despite all the chaos, reluctantly agrees to take a chance on their seven-year-old relationship, risking her reputation for the slim hope of becoming his wife. Meanwhile, Crittenden was playing both sides, his grand plan was to keep Laura as his secret partner while pretending to be the perfect husband to his oblivious wife. He genuinely believed this bizarre balancing act would fool his wife into thinking he was just a mentor to Laura. But as time went on, Laura was no longer buying the numerous promises from Crittenden. She tries to pull the plug on their relationship, as she was determined to start a new life by leaving Crittenden and moving to the cities of the East Coast. She even considered Cuba. But no matter where she went, Crittenden would follow her, begging for her return to San Francisco. Still determined to end the affair, she locked him out of his suit in the Tahoe house as long as he was married. She even shot a pistol over his head as a warning to stay away from her. But you guessed it, Crittenden wasn't one to take a hint. Every time he would come back with his apologies, swearing that he was ready to make her his wife. He even threw in the dramatic threat of taking his own life. However, things began to take a darker turn for Laura and she became depressed. She became addicted to drugs, and sometimes she would want to commit suicide. She was now living in the shadow of herself. Her mother kept urging her to end things with Crittenden and move on with her life. Finally, she agreed to marry a young man named Jesse Snyder. She had only met him recently, but she thought this could help change her image from a mistress to a modest wife and a mother. Well, it turns out that plan went south real quick. Instead of boosting her respectability, it fueled nasty rumors that sent shivers down her spine. To make matters worse, Crittenden would go behind her back and try to get rid of the young man by paying him to fake a reason for a divorce. Alexander Crittenden finally got what he wanted as Laura and her husband would divorce each other. And there he was again, with yet another promise. He promised Laura that he too would get a divorce. At some point, he seemed like a man of his word. And in 1870, he sent his wife Clara to the east and assured Laura she would not come back. He once again assured her that he would finally get the divorce he had promised for so long. But that was far from the truth. Laura would soon discover that Crittenden had already arranged to meet with his wife and children. 
At this point, Crittenden was deep into a chaotic game of trying to balance his life between his wife and Laura. Things were getting wild for him. The young businesswoman was now feeling completely ruined, and she decided to end it all. And on the evening of November 3, 1870, she followed Crittenden and his family onto the ferry, El Capitan, as they made their way to San Francisco. And just as the ferry was about to leave the port, she walked up to Alexander Crittenden and shot him point-blank in the chest. She then dropped the gun and walked away. Crittenden's 14-year-old son and a nearby policeman who was on board immediately went after her. They managed to trap her in the wheelhouse and she was arrested. The wounded Crittenden was brought home, and two days later, he was dead. As a young widow who had been in court many times due to her marital problems, Laura was made to face the court yet again. Her trial began in March 1871 and drew the attention of the national press. The case was so popular, it even overshadowed the presidential race. On the day of hearing, many locals crowded the courtroom. During her trial, she tries to play the gender card, throwing in some unwritten laws of the time as her defense. She claimed that she had acted in a fit of madness or female hysteria, believing this would set her free from the San Francisco County Jail. But the people were against her. Some even wrote about her, stating she had been so rude as to shoot a man while he was with his legal wife. But Susan B. Anthony, a member of the women's activist organization in the early 20th century, an organization that fought for the right to vote for women in the United Kingdom, stood in her defense, proposing that female hysteria was often a tool used to make women seem less important than men for a long time. But after a mere 40 minutes of deliberation, the jury found her guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced her to death by hanging on July 28th, making her the first woman to be condemned to death by hanging in San Francisco. But that wasn't over yet. Laura Fair appealed her case and got a retrial in September 1872. This time, her defense team still played the gender card, but in a more convincing way. They argued that she had the female malady, which was the reason for her actions. They claimed she had crazy attacks because of late menstruation, and she supposedly wasn't even aware that she shot Crittenden. Her lawyers would go as far as bringing three doctors and a nurse to testify that such female problems were normal, and that Fair had the issue. In the Victorian era, women's mental illness was often blamed on the menstrual cycle. She was later found not guilty, based on emotional insanity, which is similar to female hysteria. And she was freed. Everyone who heard her story was shocked by this. The press criticized the judgment, saying it was a misuse of power and a way to use women's gender against men. Historian D. Brown would write about her whole life in the West stating that she was admired just because she was one of the few women in the 1850s and 1870s who had killed a man and got away with it. Many people believed there was a rule that was not written that told seducers to be careful. Laura Fair spent the rest of her life a successful businesswoman, with an estimated net worth of $60,000 to $70,000, making her a legitimate member of the upper class in San Francisco. She died a free and single woman at age 82 on 19th October 1919. If you've enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't. My goal this year is to get the channel to 10,000 subscribers. See you in the next video.